The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints of the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each and every one of you as a believer priest in the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God directly. The first act of humility in the Christian way of life is to go to God in prayer and admit your wrongdoing or name that sin. And if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the extraordinary freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God, the Holy Spirit, give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into the seven compartments of our stream of consciousness. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2.12. You should be able to flip there easily since we've been there for a little while and for good reason. Acts 2.12 Now before I begin my message concerning what's happening in the book of Acts, and by the way, the book of Acts is a narrative. I taught this in the beginning. Some of you thought it was a bit dry, but very necessary. It's a narrative, and that means it tells a story. Now, of course, through many interpretations and through a lot of application, you can pull out some principles and mechanics, but we're really learning about the story of the early church. And the early church did not have the mechanics that we have today, though I have emphasized that we have the greater spiritual life with its mechanics. And since I taught mechanics for hundreds of hours, it should already be known. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, pastors do, so-called pastors, and they may have the gift of pastor-teacher, and I'm talking about, in general, across this whole apostate land, a lot of pastors and evangelists pick out a favorite sin of theirs. And they preach about it every Sunday. They preach about one sin one Sunday, maybe another sin the next Sunday, but sometimes maybe even just the same sin every Sunday. Well, there's this one pastor, and uh, he has a real uh, hatred for one type of sin because there's no understanding of theology or harmardiology. And I've come to understand a lot of people do not understand harmardiology when they should. A lot of people don't understand that there are the worst sins. And then there are overt sins, which take you out of fellowship. 
but I guess they've never studied uh, Proverbs. But here we have a pastor, and he had a favorite sin, and he always liked to warn people against this sin. He had one thing right, which was temperance, but uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, how to deal with temperance, it was in a very legalistic and power-hungry manner. And there are a lot of pastors who become power-hungry, and there are a lot of people who don't understand what being power-hungry is all about. A lot of people think that if a pastor shouts, reproves, and corrects, as he is supposed to, to, to do, that he is power-hungry. No. Then there are the other pastors who may be sweet in the congregation, but they are always nagging and talking about a certain sin that they don't like, even though they may participate in it. Well, here's a pastor just like that. I don't know him, but I know of the story. And this is what happened. Uh, the preacher got up and he gave a sermon. And as he was completing the sermon uh, uh, concerning temperance, he said with great expression, If I had all the beer in the world, I'd take it and I would throw it into the river. And that's how he got started. And in the congregation, you could hear them. Amen, pastor. Amen. Then, after he's stimulated by all the amens, he keeps going. With even greater emphasis, he said, And if I had all the wine in the world, I would take it and I would throw it into the river. And everybody in the congregation said, Amen! Hallelujah! Preach it, brother! And now he's really worked up. And he says, And if I had all the whiskey in the world, I'd take it in and I would throw it all into the river. And then he dramatically sat down in his seat at the right-hand side of his pulpit. Then it was time for the song leader to get up and uh, sing for about 20 minutes uh, because the pastor was finished with his message. And the song leader then stood up, and he stood up cautiously. Uh, but suddenly there was a smile that came across his face. And he announced with a very pleasant smile. Congregation, for our closing song, let us sing hymn number 365. Shall we gather at the river? So there you go. That is a pastor's favorite sin backfiring. Now, uh, here's something else that I read that's totally not related to pastors or anything else. It's, uh, it's just something that I find very odd as part of a news story. Uh, not only that, if, if you think I'm weird and I'm thought of as weird from time to time, but uh, hey, I, I don't take it personally. I might think of you as weird as well. It's part of being a human being. But this guy, I mean, I've gossiped before about people. And I'm sure you've gossiped about people. And I know God, people have gossiped about me. No skin off my back at all. It, that's what people do. Now, here's a person that might make you think twice before you gossip about someone who's at least halfway normal. So if you think I'm weird, if you think I'm off course, or if you think your friends are off course, or if you think other believers are off course because they don't follow exactly what you want them to do in arrogance, perhaps this little story will shed some light on the fact that we all need to have a little more grace orientation toward each other. This story comes out of Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, since it's from Little Rock, Arkansas, I believe every word of it. 
And this is how it begins. There's nothing illegal about a foot fetish, but police in Conway, Arkansas are looking for a toe-sucking man they said has crossed the line into assault. Now, what a job our police officers have. Police have received two complaints in the past week about a man who seems to, who seems desperate to suck women's toes, whether they want him to or not. Uh, one lady said, we want him off our streets, said Conway police spokeswoman Latricia Woodruff. Woodruff. Last Saturday, Ruth Harris, 83 years old, told police that she was sitting in a chair in front of her apartment when a man approached and said he liked her feet. According to a police report, the man took off one of her shoes and began sucking on her toe. <laughs> And you people gossip about others who do some, you know, we all have an old sin nature. Now, if you're going to gossip, well, here's something for you to think about. The man took off one of her shoes and began sucking on her toe. 83-year-old woman, Ruth Harris. That's the most loving she's probably gotten in 40 years. <laughs> this story, I'm sorry to laugh, but it just strikes me as funny. Because we all need to loosen up a little bit about each other, especially being in the royal family of God. And who knows, maybe this toe sucker is saved. Wouldn't shock me one bit. Because there's a lot of suckers saved. I don't know how many toe suckers are saved, but there's definitely a lot of suckers who are saved. Anyway, the article continues. The man then asked if he could kiss her. And she had told him no, and told him he was crazy. <laughs> the man left quickly after people walked into the apartment complex's courtyard. On Tuesday, police received another call from a woman who said that on Saturday she was shopping when she noticed a man staring at her. The man then told the woman, that he had a foot fetish. <laughs> Who does this? <laughs> and that quote, her toes are so long and succulent. What a pickup line. And let me just read this again. The man then told the woman that he had a foot fetish and that her toes are so long and succulent and he wanted to suck them. When the woman's cell phone rang, the man retreated. <laughs> the police arrived. <laughs> and she told the police the man had, quote, messed up toes. <laughs> it is not the first time the Conway man or, it is not the first time that Conway, Arkansas, has dealt with this sort of complaint. Arkansas. Bill Clinton came from Arkansas. He hired a man once who came from Arkansas. His name's Dick Morris, and that's all, all I'm going to say about that. It might be some type of thing in Arkansas. People like to do that. I don't know. I'm not being judgmental. It is freaky and crazy. And, uh, well, just think about yourself in it. I mean, I'm laughing about it. You may be as well. But here you are gossiping, gossiping about somebody here and there and someone else. Somebody said something you did not like. And it may have been totally innocuous and they didn't mean anything about it. But uh, you just have an old sin nature and you want to gossip about somebody. Well, I'll tell you something. If I, if I uh, come down from the pulpit one day and try to suck on women's toes, you can kick me out. That would be a case where, yes, kick me out and uh, wrap me up into a, uh, a white suit and put me in a mental ward. 
So then it goes on to say, but the funny thing is, okay, she's on her cell phone. The man runs away, and he's wanting to suck on her toes, but then she tells the police. She doesn't tell the police that, uh, wow, it was really weird. He was trying to suck on my toes. What a freak. He was violating my space. She didn't say that. She said, the man had weird-looking toes. <laughs> I mean, it's almost as if she was thinking about it. But, I mean, why would you answer it that way? The man had messed up toes. <laughs> it is not the first time that Conway has dealt with this sort of complaint. In the 1990s, a man who was known as the Toe Suck Fairy kept Arkansas, well, Arkansas. Now, they put an S on the end of that. How in the world do you put Arkansas? Arkansas plural. I guess they say Arkansans, but that doesn't make sense. Arkansas. People from Ark, here it is. I'll put it this way. A man who was known as the Tosa Fairy kept rednecks captivated with his foot fondling antics in Conway and Little Rock. The assailant. <laughs> Assailant, Michael Robert Wyatt, pretended to be a podiatrist in order to fondle and suck a Conway woman's toes at a clothing store. <laughs> now, if you're in a clothing store and a man comes up and says he's a podiatrist and he's going to suck on your toe, <laughs> it sounds a little bit to me like they're both involved. <laughs> And, but guess what happened to him? He received probation, a fine, and court-ordered therapy. But his probation was revoked after he was arrested in another town on similar charges. Now, <laughs> we all know that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. And a lot of that leads to some just plain weirdness and psychosis. Well, that I thought that was funny. I, that's the only reason I had to give that to you. And also to make a principle that uh, you like to gossip about people and what they do or what you think they do or what you imagine they do. And... Uh, let me tell you something. There's a lot of depravity in the world. There's no need to gossip about any of it. In fact, have a relaxed mental attitude. But we can even laugh about the toe suckers. I do, anyway. Uh, not that he shouldn't be taken out of society and put in a mental ward and put on some type of medicine so that he can stop sucking toes. But there are a lot of people who need to go and put themselves on medicine so that they can stop uh, trying to destroy one another. One of the worst things about Christians, you know, we are all royal family of God, and uh, as part of Satan's strategy, uh, there's denominations. On top of that, there are personality conflicts and everything else. And you put a bunch of Christians together, and you want to talk about Christian fellowship, I'll tell you what Christian fellowship is. It's a, a lot of Christians standing in a circle, all with AK-47s shooting at each other. That's Christian fellowship today. And it has been ever since there's been Christians. It's all through the Bible. Now, that's not how we're supposed to act, but we have old sin natures. And once you grow in grace and in knowledge, you get past that. And once you start to understand the depravity of man, whether believer or unbeliever, we have an old sin nature, you can relax a little bit. I can tell you one thing. You can gossip about me about a whole bunch of things if you want to. Some things may be true. Some things may not be true. There's one thing I can tell you. I will never suck the toe of an 83-year-old woman and get a thrill out of it. <laughs> Well, here's another one about a preacher. Let's get back to the preachers. Now, uh, this preacher decided to give a sermon on forgiving your enemies. 
And this preacher in his Sunday sermon stood up and began to eloquently speak about how everyone should forgive their enemies. That's the subject. Not a bad subject, but of course, you have to have some mechanics behind it, but I'm not going to make a big deal out of that right now. It's just part of the story. And at least he gave a long sermon, for after a long sermon, he asked the congregation, how many were willing to forgive their enemies? Now, that's a violation of privacy, but hey, it happens all the time in churches in this country in apostasy and around the world. Well, about half of them held up their hands. The other half were recalcitrant, and they say, no way, I hate my enemy. I will not forgive what they did to me. In fact, I wish they would die. Or I wish I could beat them half to death. And so the preacher was not at all satisfied with his congregation's response. So he harangued them for another 20 minutes. Now, for most pastors, that's a very long time. Uh, 20 minutes for most pastors would be like four hours for me. I've already spoken for 20 minutes. But anyway... He gets up and he speaks for 20 minutes and harangues them about how that they need to forgive one another. And then finally when he finished, the, the people were starting to get tired of hearing this man talk. After all, the sermon had gone on for 30 minutes and there had been no uh, any type of interruption with a, a song service here or there and no Sunday school. Here he is trying to make his point putting his point across for about 30 minutes, and the people are getting bored. So this time, when he asked, this time the response, about 80% of the people raised their hands. Well, the pastor still wasn't satisfied with that. Uh, a lot of pastors want unanimity, and that's where they can definitely go astray. You'll never have unanimity in a congregation or among even your own sheep. Now, sometimes uh, you'll have sheep that aren't your sheep. They'll just come and go and then go somewhere else. And then a lot of sheep just go get lost. But still unsatisfied, he lectured for another 15 minutes. Well, now we're up to 45 minutes, and that is definitely unacceptable. And so he repeated the question this time. And now everyone in the congregation was thinking about lunch, Sunday lunch, some fried chicken down south, of course. And they all raised their hands. They're ready to go out and eat. And every one of them responded, raising their hands. But he noticed one elderly lady sitting in the back who did not raise her hand. So he said, Miss Jones, are you not willing to forgive your enemies? She said, I don't have any. Well, Miss Jones, that is very unusual. How old are you? Ninety-three. Well, Miss Jones, I got to tell you, you got to come down here and you've got to get in front of this crowd and Give them your uh, testimony on how a person can live to be 93 and not have one enemy in the world. That is fantastic. I want to hear your testimony. So the little sweetheart of a lady tottered down the aisle with her cane, bending over slightly. She very slowly turned around and looked at the congregation and stared them in the eye. And she said, well, it's easy. I just outlived the bitches. <laughs> well, you have to understand, all of us have an old sin nature. And what many preachers are trying to do is eradicate what they think is a Sin, or, well, it is some of the things are sins they talk about, and the principle of forgive your enemies under impersonal love is true. 
But pastors get so wrapped up in trying to prevent a sin that they have some tab. Not that it's a taboo. That's just their area of strength. They would never do uh, what someone else would do. And they imagine how great they are. And they do as the Pharisees and pray, Oh God, thank you that I'm not like the drunk down the street. And they have no compassion for people. They just say, thank God I'm not like the drug addict down the street. Thank God I'm not like uh, the person who's involved in uh, fornication and adultery. Thank God I'm not like the homosexual who got the AIDS virus. Stuff like that, and that's how they think, and that is not a grace orientation type thinking. It's wrong. But they do pick out their favorites, and uh, one of them happens to be alcohol, which I went over earlier. And in this one, he's trying to talk about forgiving your enemies. And that's because, well, that pastor doesn't want an enemy himself. You see, probably he had been attacked. And there are some very hypersensitive people who do have the gift of pastor teacher. And they couldn't take an attack. Uh, worth anything, and if they can't get the whole congregation to like them, then they're going to go on for 45 minutes and break their all-time record of preaching just so that he can get 100% of the people saying that uh, they're not his enemy and that if he was their enemy, that they'll forgive him. But Miss Jones, 93-year-old lady, she had a correct answer. She didn't have any enemies. Why? Everyone around her died, and she put it in a very blunt way. Kind of reminds me of an aunt uh, I had, one of my favorite aunts, even though I didn't know her very long. She died when I was young, but uh, she was very good with children, obviously, and I remember her to this day. And her name was Aunt Manuela, and sometimes she would come out with some things. She was a believer. And she would come out with some things that were, as uh, for an el elderly lady, it would kind of shock most people, especially the people that I knew, because I uh, had to be around a lot of legalism uh, sometimes. So she just answered, it's easy. I outlive the bitches. <laughs> That's funny. And if you can't laugh about that, then you need to go listen to somebody else. Please do. Well, now let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 12. Acts chapter 2, verse 12. You say, I've heard it. Well, let's hear it again. What's going on is God the Holy Spirit, as part of a background, God the Holy Spirit for the first time is indwelling Peter, along with 120 other believers, and not only indwelling, but they have all suddenly become filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit then took control of the vocal cords of those who had the gift of tongues and they began speaking in foreign languages that they themselves did not understand but that the people who came from all around the world in the pilgrimage they understood and heard in their own language the gospel. And those who heard it were amazed and perplexed. Those who heard it, they understood it. And you could call that gnosis academic knowledge, they understood what was being said. Why? They were positive at God consciousness, and so they had to be given the message. And as a result, they heard the message, and when they heard it, they asked, what does this mean? And I went over that in previous messages as to how that relates to positive volition. You want to know why something is the way it is, and you want, and you want, and you come to have a desire to want to go to know God. And the more you grow in grace and in knowledge on a daily basis, the more you get to the point to where you can say, just as David said, I meditate on thy doctrine both day and night. Now I'll tell you something. I sin. I'm a sinner. But I bet I rebound. So fast, it would make your head swim. I just don't like living under the old sin nature for very long at all, especially uh, those areas that can keep you down. Bitterness. Uh, an inferiority complex is terrible because 
uh, you feel as if you're entitled to something, and you don't understand why the world doesn't see how great you are, so you make a big push to make yourself seem great, and if that doesn't help, then you will try to destroy someone else to seem great, and all that's the old sin nature. But under the power of God, the Holy Spirit, Peter is going to give the best message he's ever given yet in all of his life. Now in Acts 2.13, which we studied, some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much alcohol. They've had too much wine. They've had too much dope. They're hopped up. And that was the negative response of those who were blinded by religiosity and very quick to judge. Anytime you are very quick to judge, check yourself. Anytime you're very quick to gossip or anytime you're very quick to listen to gossip, whether true, actually gossip is true. And if you want to hear gossip that is true, there's something wrong. Why do you care? Whether it's from a pastor or whether it's from a, a person in the congregation. And then you snarkily say, a pastor must be beyond reproach. What that means is a pastor puts himself above all, all the uh, the flim-flam, all the type of hoopla that goes on in a congregation, all the gossip, maligning, and judging that goes on in a congregation. And what it actually means when it says a pastor must be above reproach, it means he has authority to kick those out who are troublemakers. That's how he's above reproach. And some of you have such a pilgrimage type legalistic attitude that you would never understand what that verse means. And you would never understand that, uh, well, what, what, what do you get out of the verse? I know what you get out of it. A pastor can't sin above reproach. And if he does sin, he must hide it very well so that no one can see it. And if he does sin, it better be a respectable sin. In other words, he can, uh, well, he can go off on doctrine. He can go off and teach some legalism. That's fine. So long as he lives what you consider a pure life. Now, that's not above reproach. A pastor's above reproach when all the naysayers, gossips, and maligners don't get under his skin anymore. Why? Because a pastor always gets reproach. It comes with the territory. And there are people who have a lust, believers who have a lust, and they want the gift of pastor-teacher, including men and women. Women should know better, but they still want it. And they want to go out and say, I can teach just as well. I can put something together just as well. The hell you can. I've been around long enough and have been teaching long enough to have learned a lot about how people are in their old sin nature. And I've learned a lot about power lust. And I had to learn a lot about it because that's not my area of weakness. And you say, but you chew people out. You must have to have some power lust. No, not at all. I'm doing my job. I like to get along with people. I like to have fun. I work hard and I play harder. That's me. I don't like to fight. I don't like to argue. It happens. But I hate it. I hate the Jerry Springer type activities that go on. Some people live for it. Some people think they're not having fun unless they are in turmoil. Well, I know enough about the word of God that it, you should be in peace in your soul. For it is the word of God that garrisons your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's the word of God that brings you peace, peace of soul, tranquility. Tranquility, what a beautiful word. 
and most everyone likes tranquility. Very few people enjoy a very cold, windy day. People like tranquility. If they go to the lake, they want tranquility. If the, they want smooth water. They want beautiful sunshine. Very little wind, if any. And if there is a wind, just a little cool breeze. That's it. No turmoil. Tranquility. And you want that in your environment. But your true environment's in your soul. And in your soul, if you are seeking out some type of fight, are you a fighter? Hey, my pastor in the past, he was a fighter. And in some, some of you, uh, listen to Colonel Theme, uh, still, and, uh, some of you have started listening to Colonel Theme and you're on some of the new tapes that are absolutely phenomenal. You might be listening to Spiritual Dynamics. But if you were to go and order Hebrews, if you think I'm tough, you've got another thing coming. I don't even get close to how tough he was on his congregation in Hebrews. He he had a reason to do it. I don't know what it was. And most people would say he went overboard, but I'm not going to judge in that way. If you ever hear Hebrews, you're going to get your toes stepped all over. And But I learned a lot from Hebrews. And he had to be tough in Hebrews because that's where we get a lot of nonsense coming out today from areas where people should know better. But that's none of my business because the pivot's moving to Ohio anyway. You laugh. Keep laughing. I smile about it. I don't know if it is or not. I just like saying it uh, just to rub people the wrong way who are against me and yet still listen. That's funny. So yes, the pivot will be right here because of me. Now that's narcissism, but I'll say it. Actually, the pivot moves all over the place, and it may never come to Ohio. It could go to Africa for all I know. Moses on Wabiko could go to India, and suddenly there's a great positive uh, volition in that area, and they become a client nation. Or he might even be able to break into communist China, in which the communist Chinese would fall, they would have to, and then China becomes the client nation. I don't know. But uh, when I said yesterday, that or the day before, whichever, that the pivot would move to Ohio and that's where it would be, well, I look at it that way because I don't see anyone teaching the Word of God and being a prolific teacher of the Word of God and one who is teaching it right down the line to where you're either going to accept it or you're going to hate it. No wishy-washy stuff. No mushy stuff. No mixture. No compromise. No changing rebound, which we know, to yield. That is stupid. And you say, no, you shouldn't say that about what someone else is teaching. Have you ever heard of Demetrius, the silversmith? You ever heard about the Apostle Paul chew out Peter? You ever heard of the Apostle Paul chew out Mark? Not my dad, but Mark in the Bible. Of course. And Peter chewed out people. It's part of having the gift and what comes along with it is authority. And you say, but they're apostles. Yeah, they had the highest authority. And then when the gift of apostleship uh, was uh, phased out in, in 96 AD, who had the highest authority then? The pastor teacher. And some of you hear about authority because you're Americans and rebellious. We've always had a rebellious streak. Uh, even our ancestors did. So, And so does all the world, really. There are some areas where they have a lot of tyranny and no freedom, so that's pathetic. But we live in a time, and we have a tremendous amount of 
freedom, so-called, unless you're trying to start a business or get a job. But that's all part of the third cycle of discipline. And we're suffering a lot in this country because of uh, arrogance. And arrogance will, lit, will, will send you into psychosis faster than anything in the world. Look at David. David, a man after God's own heart, he lost his mind. He murdered a man! The next time you gossip about me, I know people do it, but I'm just giving you an illustration. Or the next time you gossip about some other Christian that you don't like their personality, you just remember that a man after God's own heart murdered a man. Murdered him, and not only just one man, but all the people around him who were sent out to the front of the lines were murdered as well, and they weren't even part of the uh, situation in which he was trying to hide the adultery. David was a serial killer. Put it that way. He killed a lot of people. Now, serial killers do it for a thrill. He didn't do it for a thrill. But I'm trying to make a point. He killed a lot of people. Murdered. Murder! Murder! A man after God's own heart who allowed Israel to last for 420 years later and when Israel was about to go under 420 years later God said Israel will stand because of my servant David and he's a murderer. So you zip your lips with your gossip. How foolish. Yes, it's an overt sin. Yes, it's a terrible sin. But he rebounded. And that's between him and the Lord. And now he's with the Lord. And he was a man after God's own heart. Are you a person after God's own heart? I'll tell you one thing. If you're prone to gossiping every single day, or your lifestyle is one of gossip and turmoil, no, you are not. You are one of the worst believers on the face of the earth. And you're committing the worst of the sins. And David was far better than you when he sent Uriah the Hittite out to be murdered. Because here you are gossiping, maligning, and judging. Part of the worst of the seven sins, worse than murder, murder is listed as the seventh. And the only one that reaches the top of all the worst of the sins, the only overt sin mentioned, and that's in scripture. And I've taught hermodiology so much. Some some people are coming in at a time. I, I've preached uh, since, I don't know, what, 29, 28, 29, now I'm 34. I've gone over a lot of things. I've gone over acts, but I'm doing it much different today, and I'm going at a slower pace and getting a lot more out of it. And also making a lot more of application because obviously we need some application. Well, let me get with it. And let me get with the verses at hand. Peter is going to address the crowd under the power of God the Holy Spirit. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He had to. It was a large crowd. And he said, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Concentrate on what I have to say. Concentrate. Concentrate. One of the hardest things for many people to do is concentrate. It's difficult for a lot of people. And oftentimes it shows, I don't know what it shows except maybe a tad bit of a lack of interest or I don't know. Maybe it shows the, the fact that you're not filled with the spirit who brings upon concentration. And, uh, well, I do understand it. Uh, I know most of you don't know me at all, and you definitely didn't know me when I was young, very young, a, a child, all the way through my teenage years. I was tra trained to concentrate. My parents, in their wisdom, they listened to tapes every day, of 
kernel theme, and in their wisdom, they let me play for 30 minutes of the tape, and then for the rest of the 30 minutes, I had to sit quietly. Now, that wasn't cruel. 30 minutes, that's all. I didn't even have to sit the whole hour. And during that time, I started to learn to concentrate. Now, as a kid, you're not absorbing that much. Didn't even have the vocabulary for it, but I got some things out of it, I'll guarantee you that. And then as I grew into my teenage years, by the time I was 13, I was listening on my own. And I learned how to concentrate more and more and more. And my concentration level now, uh, concentration for me is natural. Not all the time. Because sometimes I'll be concentrating on something else and someone will say something to me. I'm busy concentrating on something else. Sometimes I'll try to multitask. But of course, uh, we are human. And, and sometimes uh, people might say, you've ignored me. No, I, I'm just concentrating on something else that I'm thinking about right now. And I'm not ignoring you and I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just concentrating on something. And that's the word used here. Let me explain this to you. Concentrate on what I have to say. You see, they were all distracted by the big boom. And now they're all distracted by a bunch of people that they have ridiculously called drunk. So in verse 15, he says these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And the more I've studied this and the more I've thought about it, I think Peter was being sarcastic. Because I've studied from Josephus the fact that many of those religious leaders, the Pharisees, were alcoholics. And they drank at nine in the morning. And right now, Peter is filled with God the Holy Spirit. And to say they're not drunk because it's nine in the morning, it does have some meaning. But he's putting a point across that shuts them up. Because you don't hear anything about them anymore. Why did it shut him up? Why did it shut them up? Well, it, that struck them. Because they probably woke up that morning and had a glass of wine themselves. They were wealthy enough to do so. Most Israelites weren't. The Pharisees were the cream of the crop. And they got whatever they wanted. And if they wanted to have some wine, they had it. And they were known for doing so. You can read that from Josephus, the great historian of the day. And I don't think, I, and there's no doubt in my mind that Peter, Peter knew they drank at nine in the morning. So I think there was a bit of sarcasm in this. No, I know there was sarcasm in it. He said, because right now he has raised his voice. He's under the power of God the Holy Spirit. And when you're under the power of God the Holy Spirit and you've been given an authority of communication, things can come out and things can pop into your head so quickly that you know exactly what to say at the right moment. And he wasn't really defending what they were doing, because he was talking to a bunch of negative people. He began with the insults in a very sly way. Now you say insults sitting. No. He's orienting them to their own faults, their own failures, and the fact that they too need a doctor, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, these people are not drunk as you suppose. And it's stronger than that. It's really, these people are not drunk as you gossip or malign because it's a wrong supposition. And then he says, it's only nine in the morning. 
And then that was all they had to say. They shut up about that drunkenness stuff immediately as soon as he said that. Now, they knew it was 9 in the morning. I mean, we got to think about it for a moment. They knew it was 9 in the morning. And here they are accusing someone else of drunkenness at 9 in the morning. Why? Projection. That's why. They drank at 9 in the morning. And so when Peter, Peter said, it's only 9 in the morning, well, that shut them up because it struck them a bit. They had already had their little, uh, well, maybe not even a little, they had already had their full glass of wine to kick the head, headache out from the night before. Hair of the dog. We all, well, most people understand that who uh, did not live sheltered lives. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. So those with a negative response had to concentrate instead of disrupt, as they had done up until this point, by mocking those who received the Spirit as being early morning drunks and drug abusers. So then Peter continues in verse 16. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. Now, this particular phrase means delivered from the violence of the tribulation. These are mature believers calling on the name of the Lord. Verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. See, he had to bring them around to concentration. Fellow Israelites, concentrate. Jesus of Nazareth. Now he's making them concentrate at a time when he's going to issue the worst, well, they consider it an insult, the worst insult that anyone could ever receive. But it's not an insult really because he's just telling them the truth. But he's also following up with Ray's solution. And this is what he says. Let me get back to it. Fellow Israelites, concentrate. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. They saw all those miracles and they still rejected Christ. Verse 23. This man, referring to the Lord, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you, and I, I'm telling you, he told, he, he told it to him in this way. He needs to pounce on their hard head and crack it open to get the gospel in there. They're religious. It's the only way you can deal with the religious who have not believed in Christ. It is the only way. And it's found all through scripture. And some people say, oh, that was too harsh. No, it wasn't. Perhaps they believed. I've had to do it. I've had to, I've, I've seen religious people walk in to a con, to my little congregation and I've had to give them the gospel straight and deliberately and with force. It's the only way you can break through that hard skull. I mean, look what happened to, uh, the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself had to come down and blind him for three days. They need to be hit hard. Too many people are looking for sweetness and light, and that's not the job of a pastor. And even in evangelism, the religious types need to be hit hard by the evangelist. Though the evangelist 
has a different type gift in which they just come and listen anyway. No matter his personality. When it comes to the pastor teacher, there's a certain way in which he has to deal with those who are religious because those who are religious are the greatest enemy. Religion is the devil's ace trump. And, and now I'm talking about unbelievers. But when you get into Christianity and there are believers in Christ who go into legalism and their focus is on sin this and sin that and this person did this and that and the other and you should have heard what this pastor said and I've heard some bad things about what he's done here and there and there's a lot of gossip about it and no proof. Just a lot of, a lot of gossip. Well, these are legalists and they need to be hit in the same way because they're projecting. And if they're not projecting, they're justifying themselves, deceiving themselves, becoming self-absorbed, uh, living under the arrogance complex of sins, moving into the interlocking systems of arrogance. Who do you think you are? I believed in Christ. You believed in Christ. That makes me a child of God. Not only that, royal, a royal child of God. And that makes you a royal child of God. Now, why do the children bicker? We're in the same family. Well, most families bicker. It'll be a glorious day when the resurrection occurs and all that ends. But for those who are arrogant, they have to be hit hard verbally, verbally only, and in a crowd, not one-on-one. -on -one. You've never heard me mention the name of someone and then say what a terrible, terrible person they are. I've slipped up and mentioned Obama's name, but that's for no disrespect. I respect my leader. I respect my leader and I expect him to be gone next year. Well, a year and a half later anyway. But I still respect him. And uh, if he's not gone in a year and a half, well, I don't know about respect. I might be starving and not able to respect anybody. Verse 23. And part of this is just sarcasm and joking. And, uh, uh, we can't say a lot of things as we used to in the United States, but I think I'll just follow the Constitution. Freedom of speech goes right along with freedom of religion. 23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. He just called them out for the murder of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk to me about toughness. Talk to me about personality. You see, when God the Holy Spirit takes over, God the Holy Spirit knows exactly how to direct the pastor or the apostle and what to say in order to wake up recalcitrant people and there's a way to deal with recalcitrant people and there's a way to deal with those who are positive with those who are positive they sit back and listen to you uh, berate the recalcitrant and smile because those same recalcitrants have been gossiping about them a lot of people need to grow up and learn what life is all about especially life as a Christian Now, what is occurring here is Peter is ripping apart the unbelievers, calling them out as a, as people who murdered the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's right, they did. And he has to call them out and he has to hit them so harshly. For a reason. And I also have to tell you something else. 
God the Holy Spirit brings into the life courage, true courage. You don't talk to a Pharisee like that. The Pharisees were the appointed leaders. The Pharisees were the ones to where all the people would go to receive advice on what to do on the Sabbath, where to spittle, where not to spittle, where to take a leak, where not to take a leak. And I'm serious. I'm not joking about that. That's not sarcasm. That's real. And that's how power-hungry people get, especially in legalism. Legalists go mad and power-hungry and go extraordinarily uh, into wanting to be part of someone with great power. And their motivation's all wrong. They're in wrongdoing and they're lying to God, the Holy Spirit. What is your motivation? Ask yourself, and that's between you and the Lord, what's your motivation? What pushes you? Is it arrogance? Is it you wanting to be right all the time? Is it you wanting to demonstrate how you must be smarter than someone else? Is it you listening to a bunch of claptrap about people who don't know one straight up from straight down and probably haven't heard a tape in three years or four or even five years since the colonel passed away or since he received Alzheimer's and now they're off in the Thule's and just because they say doctrine this and doctrine that doesn't mean a thing. That's like saying I'm a Baptist. Why? The Baptists started off doctrinally strong, but as soon as time went by, one generation, they went to the Thule's. And it happens every time. And so we have Colonel Thiem, who had the greatest impact on Christianity since the Apostle Paul, and then you get a lot of groups of people coming around, and they call themselves doctrinal, and they put a little leaven in here, and a little, or excuse me, they put a little yeast in here, and a little yeast in there called legalism, and the whole loaf is leavened, and they become no more than Baptist. And it degenerates into a nothing. I know of pastor teachers who came out of Baraka Church who do not teach rebound. And if you do not teach rebound, you don't have a spiritual life. And I've seen people who've listened to Colonel Thame, whose first love was Colonel Thame, who will pace this stuff proudly about how uh, there's this spiritual life of yielding here and yielding there and how uh, on one side you have the sovereignty of Christ and on the other side the sovereignty of sin and there's no mention of God the Holy Spirit. There's a mention of yield which is not even in the Greek. It's an old English language. It doesn't even mean the same thing that it means today. I saw yield today. I yielded today. It was a triangular sign that said yield. That's what it means now in the English. We rebound! Now, how hard is it to understand that? And why would you run away from your first love? The first time you learned about rebound, I guarantee you, you felt free. You had freedom. I know that's how I felt, and I've talked to a lot of people during the times when there was more positive volition, and during the times when you, who may be listening, just out of curiosity, were positive. I'm admonishing you out of love. Now, if you don't like me, and you don't like my voice, and you don't like my personality, and you don't like the way I teach, go back to the colonel. Go back to your first love. Stop farting around with idiots. I mean idiots. You will not grow by yielding to anything. You can't reinvent the wheel. And these people, they are not filled with integrity. You talk about integrity, you think of integrity as morality. Morality is for the entire human race. Morality is designed to stabilize society. Some of the most moral people I've ever known are unbelievers. 
And you cannot solve the problems of life with morality. You can only solve the problems of life as a believer with virtue. And you can only have virtue if you understand rebound. And if you don't understand rebound and are so dumb as to go back to some old English term called yield that has no meaning and is nothing but a bunch of confusion, you are not filled with integrity. You are a loser an eptozoid believer leading people astray. And I have a right to say it. My pastor did not spend 50 years beating him and more, beating his brains out and creating a whole new language for people to learn so that they can know what the unique spiritual life is so that a group of idiots can come along, claim to be doctrinal and claim to have some type of great knowledge and breakthrough and come through with the same old crap that's been around for centuries. Yield. Yield, brother, yield. You don't yield. What what does the book say that Colonel Theme wrote? Rebound and keep moving. That's the opposite of yield. Yield indicates that you are doing something, some type of sacrifice, and you do not sacrifice. The sacrifice was done by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And even he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And he was referencing the unique spiritual life that he's passed on to you. He lived the prototype. You lived the protocol. Do you remember those terms? Now, the reason I'm doing that is because some of you were positive toward the word. What, what, what happened to you? You need to go back. You were the salt of the earth. The country prospered while you were positive. Now the country's going to hell, and you spend more time talking about Barack Obama than you ever would spending time listening to current Colonel theme that you probably don't even listen to anymore. Now you're listening to nonsense about yielding and spending all your time talking about your leader, Barack Obama. You're the reason the country's going under. Wake up. Get off your high horse. Learn what authority's all about. If you listen to me and you say, I don't respect your authority and I'm not going to listen to you, you're an obnoxious, arrogant SOB, then, well, don't bother with me. But you did listen to the colonel once. Stick with him. Or maybe you think he's an obnoxious SOB, but you won't say it because he's gone now with the Lord. He was right. Everyone else you see around you that's going astray is wrong. They're not breaking through with something new. They're coming out with stuff that is so old and stupid, old English language written back in the 1600s and going back to a legalism that I've heard all my life and that people before me have heard all their life about yielding brother yield and about this, that, and the other. And I don't care if you put it in some type of form to where you say, on this side you yield this way, and on this side you yield that way. Yield means to look to your left as you're driving onto the highway, and if there's a semi-truck there, you uh, yield. You give them the right of way. Now, what in the world does that have to do with rebound, which is what yield means where it is written? That's Old English. Now, in Old English, they understood it. But today, it's totally different. You don't yield. You rebound, and you keep moving. You put the pedal to the metal. You rebound, you're filled with a spirit, and then you move right on with Bible doctrine. Who are you yielding for? Yielding has that type of, I'm doing something. It has arrogance written all over it, that I am going to yield for the Lord and sacrifice, and that there are those 
who have in, uh, when they're spiritual babes, they're in level one sacrifice. And when they go into spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual adolescence, they have level two sacrifice. And then they go to the greatest sacrifice when they are spiritually mature. And that's a bunch of asceticism. And not only that, it's legalism. And it's wrong. It is so terribly wrong. And anti-grace. Wake up. Before you destroy this country. And before you stand before the Lord and are in complete shame. Because you left grace. You're shipwrecked. You do not sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ did all the sacrifice. We're to grow in grace and in knowledge. And we are to be filled with the Spirit. And guess what? Then God the Holy Spirit produces what we need in our lives. It's not even really us doing anything. God the Holy Spirit operating right through our lives. And the only thing you have to do is relax, have an RMA, and enjoy life. I do. I've never been happier. Never. The more I learn, the happier I become. And the more I learn, the more capacity for life I have. And I can have fun doing just about anything. I don't get bored, do you? And I'm not bragging. I'm telling you the truth. Because I hear people talking every now and then, I got bored. Or I get bored. People my age. I don't get bored. It's not even possible. I can sit in a chair and just think about the word of God. I'm not bored. It's time to wake up. And yes, I'm chewing all of you out who's listening. And some of you who already know what it's all about, you're probably finally glad and cheering that somebody is bringing it to light. Now there are some who are teaching the word of God wonderfully that I know of in the past anyway, but it's been years since I've uh, visited a church uh, that had had any influence from Colonel Arby Theme Jr. Uh, the last one was in Albany, Georgia, or, yeah, Albany, Georgia. I don't know why I, I forget his name, but he was a very pleasant man to be around, and he taught the doctrine straight, and he had a different personality, of course, we all do, but the doctrine was there. And he had a rather sizable congregation to be teaching Bible doctrine. What was his name? Oh, well, I don't know. I don't think he's even on the web. He just does his own thing in the local congregation. And I've heard some others in the past. I don't know what they're doing now. I heard about Rick Knapp at, during the late 90s. I don't know what happened. I don't hear anything about him. He's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I don't know what. Uh, well, I heard one last thing that he said. I won't talk about it. But uh, he was in Pittsburgh. And I know of Joe Griffin in St. Louis. And, of course, Bobby in Houston. But the pivot's on the move. It's going to move. And uh, in the future, probably in about a week or two, I'm going to start explaining some things and why I do some things a certain way. And especially when it comes to feeding the flock daily. Now even I failed at that from time to time. I work with my own hands and that's not really an excuse. I have to be motivated. And I am more and more motivated. The time is now to get with it. We can turn this ship around. We can turn the world upside down. You can turn the world upside down. But you're going to have to be willing to become humble. To listen. And to understand that not every time I shout 
is it toward you? And to understand that it's all from an impersonal situation. I'm not looking at you. You're not looking at me. I don't even know who's listening. I know there's a lot more. I was shocked when I looked at the statistics today. I was thinking 11 and 12 here and there. And, uh, you know, I'm not much about numbers, but I'll close, I'll close it out this way because it is interesting, uh, uh, to see how things are going. Because if it, if, as far as numbers goes, if it went to zero, I would quit in a heartbeat because that would give me a lot more time to do enjoyable things that I enjoy doing. Not that I don't enjoy this. It's just a work. It's work. But here it is. And uh, I finally read up on how to read this thing, this web thing, on how to figure out the numbers, etc. And it's totally different than the way I thought. Because they separate it out into brand new people coming in from people who consistently come in. Well, the people who consistently come came in in June, and I am giving out numbers, but I know people are curious, so am I. In June, 104. And that was for the people, and, and, and this number, it's more than that. You could combine the numbers, but I'll, I'll, I'll separate it out as they did. The, this 104 means these are people who, who returned. I don't know how many times, but they listened more than once during the month of June. 104 people. From June to July, there was a 37% increase. The number of people who listened more than once went up to 141. And then from July to August, there was an 8% increase. And the number of people who listened at least more than once, 152. But that's not all. That, that, <clears throat> that's actually, that doesn't include all the numbers. Because it calculates new people who come in differently. And don't worry, I don't know who you are. It goes by IP address, and I don't know anything about IP address. The only thing it does, it's picking up an IP, a different IP here, and a different IP there. And it's going off of one computer. So when I say 104, I'm saying there were 104 computers that listened in June. And, you know, and I say computers because you could have two, three people around a computer, but probably most of the time one. And then... Uh, the other statistic has to do with the number of new people who come in for the first time. And they are not calculated as of yet in the area of those who listen more than once a month. In June, 50 new arrivals. From June to July, there was a 21% increase. 61 new arrivals. And from July to August, I have the September numbers. September's not over yet, and uh, there, there, there are more as well. But it's not about numbers. I am just giving you an idea that there can be hope and that you might not like my personality and you might not like me at all. Well, maybe I'm not your right pastor, but uh, I'm definitely the right pastor to quite a few people, more people than I ever thought I would be. And then from July to August, increased to 81 brand new souls coming in and taking a listen. And, uh, well, a lot of people, well here, a lot of people are really into numbers. I'm about to close out anyway. It's really late. And, uh, I don't have much to do at 102 in the morning. Nothing good happens after midnight. Maybe that's why I get such grief. 104. Well, let me just go with right now. Not right now, but with 
the month of August. Two hundred and thirty three people didn't just visit. Oh, I have the visitation numbers. And I it would be stupid to give those because the visitation numbers, they just come and look, they don't listen. These numbers are those who have listened to something, even the new ones. And in the month of August, the people that listened to at least something, two hundred and thirty three. Now the number of people who were looking around in curiosity, well, that doesn't really matter. A lot more, though. But it's not about numbers, but it is about numbers in the sense of we need people to replace the pivot that is shrinking. We need my generation and those younger than me to begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge and to understand the importance of the daily intake of the word of God. At one point, it was my parents' generation. They understood it, at least a, a, good, por a good portion who listened to Carl theme understood that. But they've gone away from that, so much so they become arrogant, so much so that they despise youth or are jealous that youth may actually know something. That's why the Apostle Paul told Timothy, do not let them despise you because of your youth. 34 is youth when it comes to teaching Bible doctrine. Under the Jewish law, you had to be 30 years old before you could teach the law. 34 is young. So I get it. Very few people who are in their 50s want to hear some 34-year-old chew them out and tell them how they're way off base. But you are! You don't yield! You rebound! You rebound! You heard it before. You've lost your first love. You are shipwrecked. You are listening to women and men. And you are tickling your ear ears all over the place. And you are destined to die. To sin face to face with death. And destined to be before the Lord Jesus Christ. Who will look at you and say, what did you do with this unique spiritual life? And you will feel utterly ashamed. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to what we've noted in the book of Acts. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.